This morning I'm thinking about ego. There have been a number of conversations that I've had in the last few weeks that have gotten me thinking about a number of questions in reference to ego. Is it possible to move beyond ego? And if and when we do, uh, is it possible to remain where we have arrived? In working to express any sensation of movement beyond the ego that I've experienced, here's what I notice. My intellect can get me so far in that it can get me to the understanding that the ego construct cannot itself extinguish the ego. It's in my very understanding of the impotence of the ego that a flip or a shift can take place and move me beyond ego. What's fascinating to note about where this flip takes place is that its very essence is paradox. When I surrender to that understanding of the constraints of my finite form and the ego construct that may be trying to hold me there, <laughs> the expansion that follows is something that is always uh, accompanied by laughter. It's this uh, comedy that is inherent to me in um, the remembering, the recollection that I came into this body uh, from the source of my energy, from the source of my life. That I, in doing so, chose to do that. I chose to be limited by these ego constructs by this thought form, this veil of thought, limiting my view to the eternal present. My eternal source of life energy chose that. In a way, I am laughing as I see and recollect that I at once dealt myself the cards that I am working with the very cards that I'm working with in order to remember that I dealt them to myself. <laughs> Without further ado, I thank you for playing with me today and I'll move on toward my vocal readings. I am reading from Ram Das, Paths to God. Enjoy. For centuries, readers have turned to the Bhagavad Gita for inspiration and guidance as they chart their own spiritual paths. As profound and powerful as this classic text has been for generations of seekers, integrating its lessons into the ordinary patterns of our lives can ultimately seem beyond our reach. Now, in a fascinating series of reflections, anecdotes, stories, and exercises, Ram Das gives us a unique and accessible roadmap for experiencing divinity in everyday life. Page one. We are coming out of a kind of sickness here in the West, a sickness in the way in which we have overthought, the way in which we have been intellectually way ahead of our hearts and our body's wisdom. I'll read three parts from page 27. The way a culture socializes its children, and we are all products of the process, is by teaching them to rely primarily on judgments from outside themselves. To socialize a child, you need to instill in him only three basic principles. To accept his information from the outside, to look outside for his rewards, and to ignore his inner voice if it conflicts with what comes from outside authority. That's the way you train a child to be a member of a society, so that when mother says do this, you do it, even if in your heart it doesn't feel right. If you get good enough at doing that, you become a success in the society, and if you don't, you're an outcast. Skipping down. Awakening is like moving from one plane to another in the flow of consciousness, and at times, it may seem that we're being forced to go against the current of the old plane in order to come into some deeper harmony with the new one. Skipping down again. The predicament is that the web of thought was designed precisely to keep us in it. It's not going to let us go so easily. And that's where the work of the spiritual journey comes in. 
We look for practices that will give us a foothold outside our thought forms or that will jolt us outside of our thinking minds and set us free. Page 43. Karma is basically a pattern of life waves or desire waves. They keep going and going life after life until they spend themselves. When they do, there's no more individual desire, no more separation, and therefore no more incarnation. The game is over. If you experience your present life from that perspective as one sequence in a long unfolding pattern of karmic law, then the time and place you took birth, what your parents are like, who your brothers and sisters are, whom you marry, whether you have children, what experiences you have in life, you will see all of that as part of a predetermined karmic package. The universe and you in it are just an ongoing expression of karmic law. You and everything you see around you, alive and otherwise, are perfect law unfolding. Page 52. We each have our own path. I don't know what yours is. I can hardly figure out my own. What I can predict, though, is that for you, as for Arjuna, it will probably include giving up some cherished notions about yourself, some ideas about who you are and where you're going. Gradually, it begins to dawn on us that we are merely part of a process. Page 61. Once you're acting purely out of dharma, you're beyond the law of action. When you've totally surrendered yourself to your dharma, you're no longer acting out of striving, but out of spirit. When that happens, you're no longer creating any more karma for yourself. You only act to fulfill the dharma, not out of any personal motive, so no karma accrues. Not only that, not only do you stop building up your karma account, but your whole relationship to your life changes. It all becomes a pageant, a play. Page 80. As we move toward wisdom, we move on a path from intellect to intuition, from knowing we know about something to an intuitive sense of our interconnectedness with everything. Intuitive wisdom is a non-conceptual appreciation of something through becoming one with it. That's a deeper way of understanding things and it's a doorway to becoming wisdom. Page 93. When we can see beyond all the slide projections of who I am and who you are, and when we can look past all the overlay of our habitual thought, we find to our surprise that there is only one of us. We find that it's all an internal matter, that it's always just God dancing with God. Page 102. What's fun is that when you're no longer attached to being one separate part of it, you get to be part of all of it. At that point, the all is known to you subjectively and you are everywhere at once because you are no longer pinned in a space-time locus by your separateness. Page 128. From a practical point of view, we're faced with an interesting paradox. At one level of our intellectual understanding, we know that we already have all the riches. We know that we are the Atman, that we are the Buddha, that we are free. We know all that. But if we look inside, we'll notice that although we know it, we somehow don't believe it. And that's what all the purification methods are about. Getting us from where we seem to think we still are to where we don't think we're anywhere anymore. Hence... We have all these practices like karma yoga and janana yoga, like sacrifice and mantra, like renunciation and purification. All of them, by one route or another, are designed to get around that roadblock between our knowing and our believing. Page 133. It isn't better to give up sex or better to fast. We don't do renunciation practices to be good. That's falling into the sattvic trap, the trap of being attached to being somebody nice. We renounce things because we want to give them up. We do it because we see how they're holding us. 
And we've identified ourselves with something that's much more interesting than the immediate gratification, the next chocolate bar. We renounce things when our desire to get on with the journey is stronger than our desire for the next ice cream soda. Page 144. We often find, as we go merrily on our spiritual way, that we have to reverse ourselves if we want to stay with our truth. Finding our dharma is a little like finding a floating crop game. It doesn't stay in one place, it's always changing its location. You think you know where your route is. You've just gotten all your new outfits and beads and brownie badges. All the things that go with your new shtick. And then suddenly, the whole thing turns dead and empty and horrible. What are you going to do? My commitment must be to truth, not to consistency. Give the outfits to the nearest Salvation Army thrift store and go on. After a while, you get so you just rent the costumes. You don't buy them. Because you see that you're going to be moving through the trips very, very quickly. You just keep staying as close as you can to your living truth. I'm on page 147, and this will be the last passage I read in this video. The trouble is, we can only tell the truth when we cease to identify with the part of ourselves we think we have to protect. If we're afraid of being laughed at or taunted or killed, we can't tell the truth. We can't tell the truth if we're busy guarding some position. It's only when we realize that we're not as vulnerable as we fear we are that we can afford to tell the truth. Let's say I tell you the truth and you don't like it and you get up and walk out. That's your problem, not mine. But if I need your love, your interpersonal love, then I can't risk having you walk out on me and so I can't tell you the truth. I can never be straight with you if I need something from you. So in order to tell the truth to you, I have to give up whatever that need is in myself. 